as if a two and a half hour long Zoom class isn't enough torture for my eyeballs, I also get blinded every single time I look outside. But also my poo-poo brain do be needing that natural light, so... Let's look at some weird doodles to alleviate the pain. Just pressed go for camera. Um, let's go. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Sophia and welcome to Underqualified. Today we're going to be talking about medieval art, um, or specifically art from the high middle ages to the late middle ages. So that's like, uh, what is that? That's like the 11th through the 13th century? The 11th through the 13th century. I really hope you appreciated all of those THs because, trust me, they were painful. So during the Middle Ages, the church had acquired a lot of power. They had wealthy patrons and also there was just widespread belief in general, this system of Christianity. But they wanted more people. They wanted more power. So they tried to evangelize to a new clientele. Um, clientele is not the appropriate word, but that's all I can think of right now. Anyways, they tried to evangelize to new people, I guess, um, and they chose the illiterate poor. Now, again, illiterate poor, um, the church in order to spread its message without having to use word, uh, came up with a really comprehensive and really powerful visual vocabulary that um, kind of permeated its way through a lot of different forms of art. You got symbols like the mandorla, which is like an almond-shaped ring of light that surrounds various religious figures. It's a way of conveying visually that God was with them. Going along with the theme of light, which is going to come up a lot in this video, you get the rose windows, which show an interaction with light and also just the beauty of having God illuminate your soul um, or something along those lines. With Gothic art, you got Gothic cathedrals. Uh, and you got these statues with really elongated bodies. If you are making something that's supposed to be above you and you stretch it out, it's going to end up kind of looking like the right proportions when you look at it. It's a technique called skewed perspective. And if you want a little bit more of a current example of skewed perspective, you can look at sidewalk artists and the illusions that they make. Uh who else? Who else did we get? Oh, we also got Byzantine art, which was very opulent. Um, and there were a lot of paintings that had gold gilding, again, as a way to show power and as a way to make things so beautiful that people couldn't help but join the church. But also during the Middle Ages, you had the bubonic plague. And during that time, um, in order to really cope with and rationalize all the bad things that were happening, um, people turned to religion and they developed ways of academic writing, art making, and um, just religious contemplation, I suppose. Um, they developed new ways of doing all of those um, so as to convey this idea of pain and suffering having a reason. As a result, martyrdom was really glorified at the time, um, and a lot of art was gory. Um, it was really gory, it was really gruesome torture um, or death that these figures were being put through, but they'd always have this expression of calm um, because they've already made peace with what's about to happen with them, and they know that God will keep them protected. Um, at least keep their soul protected. And in all of this um, artwork being made surrounding the bubonic plague, it really became evident that people were treating vulnerability as a coping mechanism. Um, or I guess to some extent, vulnerability was inevitable because how much protection do you actually have at a time like that? And this almost forced vulnerability manifested itself in a really intense display of emotion. So now that all of that is out of the way, all of that um, rambling is out of the way, uh, we're gonna get on to some examples of 
medieval art, a structure that's really seen as like a pinnacle of gothic architecture anyways, uh, is, hold on, um, I've been back on Duolingo for a week now, uh, <laughs> so let me flex, um, uh, yeah, one of the uh, pinnacle of gothic architecture is La Cathédrale Notre-Dame de Chartres. Yeah, so this cathedral, um, has a lot of the, like, basic components of gothic architecture. There's a lot of flying buttresses on the exterior, which are supposed to look skeletal, um, which is, again, a reference back to this fixation on death that people had. On the interior, there were vaulted ceilings, which gave strength to the structure while also minimizing the amount of support that's needed for the ceiling. So, like, the, the columns on the interior could be smaller and allow more light to pass through, which, again, is symbolic of the light of God. And you get this huge rose window. Um, which I'm just gonna let you look at for a couple seconds because it's gorgeous. Very expensive, but gorgeous. <laughs> Another medium that was really prevalent during the Middle Ages is tapestry work. I'm gonna share with you the hunt of the unicorns. And like, yeah, I like to, if I go to an art museum and I go through the medieval section, I like to poke fun at, um, at like the wacky proportions of everything, even though it is something to be taken seriously, even though it is something that is very, um, representative of, it is very representative of human emotion. Um, the proportions just look stupid. And the compositions are often weird <laughs> um, by today's standards. Anyways, but I don't know, it's just a really lovely, a really high detailed little series, um, which is something that you can always appreciate. You can always appreciate the time and effort that an artist puts into their work. Um, did I want to talk about something? I wanted to talk about something. Oh, yeah, unicorns. Um, I believe they originated uh, through Greek myth, but the church during the Middle Ages had appropriated that imagery of the unicorn to symbolize Christ, right? Because of the purity that's associated with unicorns. And also part of the unicorn myth is that, is that they could only be tamed if they were lying in the lap of a virgin. And so that virgin, um, if we're talking about Christ, is Mary. And the whole laying in the lap thing is equated to Christ lying in Mary's room, womb. Not her room. <laughs> I mean, I'm, at some point he probably lied in her room. You know, that's a mother-son thing. Um, stop talking. Okay. Um... Right, paintings. I was going to talk about paintings. I was going to m talk about paintings of Saint Agatha. Like I said earlier, there was this fixation on martyrdom, and Saint Agatha is one of the most highly renowned, highly renowned, most well known um, virgin martyrs um, within the Catholic Church. She pledged the vow of celibacy, and there were a lot of people, a lot of men, that were like, no, 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 you're mine now. Um, and she didn't appreciate that. And one of her suitors got a got very carried away and uh, proceeded to imprison her. And when she didn't really protest either of those, she was pretty content, like, back to um, what I was saying about martyrs. She always seemed pretty content with what was happening to her because she knew that she had God on her side. And one of the ways that he tortured her was just cutting off her titty. It's pretty gruesome. Um, a lot of the imagery surrounding her either shows the process of her Pity. being cut off, or the aftermath, which is her very calm offering up her Pity. to somebody, to the Lord, Pity. for the Lord. Um, <laughs> I'm going to hell. Okay. And now we're going to get to the good stuff. We're going to get to the raison d'etre. Um, the reason for my being in this video. <laughs> Um, and the reason why I wanted to make this video is because, because of these amazing doodles. Illuminated texts were, are, were typically created by monastic clergy members or just people, um, just craftspeople in general. And they really bridge the gap between the written word and image making. And often whoever was making books would add illustrations that would reinforce the religious ideals that were being shared in the text. Illuminated texts didn't only come out of Europe during um, during the Middle Ages. There were also some really beautiful manuscripts that came out of the Middle East. 
the work from the Middle East gives its own sense of intrigue because there is, um, to my understanding anyway, there is no inclusion of figures, so that means people or animals in their texts, and so um, their illuminated texts feature a lot of a lot of ornamentation that's really lovely to look at. 10 out of 10 would recommend. Anyways, doodles. Let's talk about doodles. So I'm just gonna go on Ecosia <laughs> and um, look up, what am I looking up? Medieval illuminated text doodles. Okay, these were doodles that like I said, a lot of the imagery had religious purpose, but some of them did not. <laughs> some of them did not. And those are the ones that I really care about. The ones that mean absolutely nothing to nobody. <laughs> um, medieval illuminated text didn't work, so let's try illuminated... Oh, let's try medieval snail art, and oh boy, there it is. So this is <laughs> one. I frequently look this up on Google Images, but I don't... I haven't looked at it on Ecosia in a while, so I'm in for a surprise in this first four. <laughs> oh, what is he holding? I mean, a, a, a dagger, obviously, but is that a shoe? <laughs> is that a steak? <laughs> He's like, man, this is mine. I'm pretty uncomfortable with the idea of a squirrel and a snail combining? I don't know why that's more disturbing to me than the fact that it's holding a knife, um, but... <laughs> Let's continue. Oh, a classic. An absolute classic, an absolute gem. We love to see it. We love to see... Oh, this beautiful... This beautiful knight fighting this beautifully large snail. The snail is winning. The snail is scaring the knight, but it's also hold on, but it's also scaring the shield. Um, I don't know where this knight's sword went. It kind of looks like he's holding a boom whacker. Um, which the sound of a boom whacker hitting a snail must be. Mwah. Oh, there's more. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. Uh, yeah, like I said, there's no meaning to these. The bird looks pretty happy. Um, the bird looks pretty happy. The cat looks scared, which I understand, which resonates with me because um, I'm also scared looking at him. But what's more terrifying is that there's this implication that there is something just off screen that is scaring the cat. And if that thing's getting scared of something else, I don't even want to know what the other thing is. Oh, maybe it's that bird's cloaca. <laughs> Much to think about. Much to think about. Um, okay, there's a cat snail. There's a- oh, here's another classic. It is the man in a dress holding a snake stick with a farmer's hat. Fighting a snail. And again, the knight always looks scared of the snail. And I'm not really sure why. I'm going to leave a link um, down below of this video. Um, and they present the idea that the snail represents the inevitability of death. Like, it's slow moving, but like eventually it's going to get you. Um, I don't get it. I don't get it. Oh, look at the poor form on this boy. <laughs> boy, you gotta spread your legs. You gotta, you gotta do this. And square your hips and then whack, whack. Also, why is it flying? I like that this one is bargaining with the snail. I think with how fierce snails are in this alternate universe, um, I think it's only fitting that this knight is pleading with him please do not take my life with your snaily little body oh okay i was telling myself that i was done looking at um the snail animal combinations it's a really good one it's this rabbit 
coyote looking thing. If it's a rabbit snail, that's very confusing because if the snail is used um, in place of things that are slow moving, but there's also a rabbit, it's a lot of mixed messages. And also, I like that it looks like it took the whole town to fight this thing off. Uh, let's look around a little bit more. I think one last one. Oh, here we go. This wise elder that I found on TikTok suggested that you stop looking at social media when you find something that makes you really happy. Um, and I've found it. Who is he? And also what pace does this creature move at? Because I'm very confused. Again, the fast, slow dichotomy. I don't understand why this rabbit would feel the need to locomote via snail. My favorite part is that it looks like he's really settled onto this snail, but he also looks surprised. And I don't know why you would be surprised after mounting this snail man, um, not during. If you've made it to the end of this video, I hope you're having a good day, or I hope that your day gets better. I implore you to drink your water, take a bathroom break, get some food, eat a fruit or a veggie today if you can. Um, take your meds, take a break from wearing your binder, stay safe, wash your hands with soap. Because let me tell you, quick science fact, quick, quick science interjection in this holy art video. Soap molecules have a polar side and a non-polar side. The polar side is what attracts the water and the non-polar side is what attracts the oils and the dirts. So the soap molecules kind of bind them together so that the water can actually wash off any of the fats that are on your hands. Just using water ain't gonna do anything. Use your soap! As always, my sources are gonna be linked down below so that you can do some more reading of your own if you feel so inclined. If you think I've missed something important or if you just wanna talk about medieval art with me, leave a comment down below or you can DM me on Instagram. On Instagram. <laughs> on Instagram. Where do I wanna point? I don't know anymore. I don't know anything anymore. I'm always eager to learn from other people because after all, I'm underqualified. Roll that outro. Oh, I'm not cool enough to say it like that. <laughs> oh, okay, bye. I'm tired. La cathédrale Notre-Dame de Chartres. And by the way, I opted to say it in French because I don't know how we say that last word in English. <laughs>